Are BP ICE competitors really better for your investments? In this video, we're settling this once and for all. We are comparing BDO, Metro Bank, RCBC, and East West Bank in terms of its US equity feeder funds. And more than just comparing their rates and offers, we are crunching the numbers. We are looking to see what your money can look like in a matter of 10 years when you invest in these funds. I'm excited to share with you the results and learnings, so let's go. But before anything, if you are new to this channel, hi, I'm Mark. It's nice to meet you. In this channel, I covered quite a bit about lifestyle, but I mostly talk about business and investments. A few weeks ago, I shared with you the alarming news that BPI has raised their trust fees for many of their investment funds. Now specifically, my cause for concern would be for the BPI US Equity Feeder Fund, where the trust fee has doubled from previously at 0.75%, now it's at a whopping 1.5%. I've invested a lot of my money in the BPI US Equity Feeder Fund because it's stacking the S&P 500. And as you should know by now, the S&P 500 is really the benchmark of the top 500 US corporations. Historically, it's grown and it's been the most reliable that if you just left your money or keep investing in the S&P 500, this would be the nearest thing to a sure way of you growing your money. Now with BPI raising their trust fees, I've shared with you that there are alternatives out there. BPI's competition has lower per annum trust fees. Now, without considering the trust fees, BPI would come out on top. You can invest for as little as $1, and I've invested as often as possible for the lowest amount that I could. This strategy is about lowering my cost of average. I don't really think about when I would come in, but just do it again as regularly as possible. So this has been my strategy for a while now. But with BPI's raising of their fees, I have begun to rethink if this is the best approach. So while we don't have a crystal ball or a sure way to see how these funds would be performing in the next few years, what we do have are historical data. And even though the historical performance of a fund is not telling of how a fund would perform, at least we are able to see how our money would have performed if we had put it in these different funds. So today, we have an experiment. Again, I'm trying to see how our money could have performed when invested regularly in these different UITFs that are tracking the S&P 500. Now, this video has been weeks in the making. I've actually gone through a lot of computations, a lot of number crunching, because I've looked at the daily value of the S&P 500 in the last 10 years. Now, while I think there may still be a few errors here, I'm pretty confident enough to share these results. It took me that much time. I don't know, because maybe I'm not a business or a math major. So I really need to go through thousands and thousands of rows of data trying to see carefully which bank can really give us the best return of investment. Now before sharing with you the results, it's important for you to understand the methodology, the computations of how I actually went about this experiment. Now let me walk you through this and please be very patient. Step one was for me to download the daily values of the S&P 500 in the last 10 years. Now, you might be wondering, why didn't I just get the performance of BDO, Metro Bank, RCBC, East West, and BPI and plug this in and see how they have performed? Well, the reason is, some of these funds haven't even been around for 10 years. I saw that using the S&P 500 can produce the most fair and objective results with just tweaking the strategy based on the minimum investment that we need to do for additional top-ups. So going back with the daily value of the S&P 500, I assigned the daily net asset value per unit. I use 10% of the S&P 500 as the nav pool. My purpose for this is to be able to plug in the invested amount and see how many units that the invested amount can come up with. So as an example, at the start of this experiment, the S&P 500 was at 1,306, 10% of this representing the nav pool. And the amount that I'm looking to invest in daily would be $3. So the minimum investment amount of $3 divided by the NAVPU would amount to 0 0.022-9651-007 units that I could avail per day. Again, I wanted this to be easily comparable after investing $3 per day with the commensurate number of units that I'm able to buy. I am able to tally up the number of units that we can accumulate. And at the end of every year, I am able to deduct the per annum trust fees for this 10-year data, I did it a total of 10 times. So by the way, again for purpose of uniformity, this experiment only factors in the additional investments that's needed to top up. Since each bank has a different investment minimum for starting the investment, 
I didn't really factor that in anymore because it would kind of just skew the entire data. This would help me keep the total amount investment to a more comparable size. And now it's time to share the results. First with the BPI data. Finally found it. So for BPI, again not being limited by high investment minimums, the total amount invested is $9,822. Again, that's over the course of 10 years, $3 per day, not factoring in of course weekends, and this would only be covering the weekdays of each year. The total before the per annum trust fees is $21,716.87. Once you plug in the per annum trust fees, the new total is $20,328.80, which is a return of about 207%. So I know it all sounds good right now, but this is just result number one. Please hold before you make any conclusions. So we move on to the second bank, which is East West Bank. As a refresher, the subsequent investments for East West is at $200 each time. So instead of investing daily, my assumption here is that we are putting it aside, we are putting away our $3, you're able to do your subsequent investments every 70 days, so more or less you get around $210 at that point. So because of this limiting factor, the total invested amount is of course lower as well, it's at $9,654. Now after 10 years of investing every 70 days, the total is at $21,172.67. This is before the per annum trust fees. Once you factored in the 0.5% per annum trust fee, the total is at $20,724.88. So this is a return of 214.68%. So as you see from example number two, East West Bank is actually beating BPI already. And even though the investment is much less, the returns in terms of actual value is already higher. So it's getting interesting. So let's move on to the third bank. The third bank is actually RCBC. And I'm so sorry that I left them out from a previous video. It was actually you, one of my viewers, who called me out on this. And I said, I'm so sorry for leaving out RCBC. Compared to Metro Bank, wherein the investment minimum is $500, RCBC's investment minimum is only at $200. So it's $200 for to start, $100 each time, and per annum trust fees similar to Metro Bank at 0.75%. So we are going to be able to compare RCBC and Metro Bank as the third and fourth example with the minimum of only $100. Again, we are setting aside $3 each day. You are able to invest in the RCBC and Metro Bank US Equity Feeder Fund every 35 days. So it will be more frequent than your investment through East West Bank. So the total amount that you would have invested over the course of 10 years is $9,744. The total amount of your investment before their per annum trust fees is at $21,578.17. Once you plug in the 0.75% trust fee per annum, the result is $20,893.40. So from the initial investment, this is a return of 214.42%. In terms of actual amount, it's a little higher than East West Bank. East West, RCBC, and Metro have results that are actually within 1% of one another. So in many ways, I would consider them a triple tie. So let's move on to the last and final bank, which is BDO. As mentioned in my previous video, BDO is actually the most limiting in terms of the investment. Factoring in again the $3 per day that we are setting aside to invest in this fund, you're only able to really invest in the BDO fund every 168 days because of the minimum investment of $500 each time. So more or less, that's going to be between 5 and 6 months. Um, I guess the good thing is it's not as tedious and you only have to do it a few times a year. But the downside there is perhaps missing some opportunities because of the high investment amount. The total invested amount after the course of 10 years via BDO is at $9,570. And the resulting total value of that after 10 years before the per annum trust fees is at $20,763.81. So BDO, just like East West, has the lowest trust fees at 0.5%. The total resulting amount is $20,337.69. So the total rate of return is actually not bad. It's at 212.52%. The result is actually quite comparable to that of RCBC, East West, and Metro Bank. So let's put this all together. 
in rank number five, the worst performing one, unfortunately for me, is the BPI US Equity Feeder Fund. And that's the one I've invested in the most in the past few years. So BPI's rate of return is only at 206.97%. At rank number 4 would be BDO at 212.52%. Ranks number 2 and 3 are tied between RCBC and Metro Bank. The rate of return again is at 214.42%. And at rank number 1, with returns of 214.68%, would be East West Bank. So what are our learnings here and what are the few things that we can observe? Well, if you notice, because of the low investment minimum with BPI, in terms of actual value before the trust fees, BPI is way ahead in terms of performance, again at $21,716.87. So the daily investing strategy actually works, and we could have continued to do that. But where there is a big blunder now, and why I think I should be moving out of BPI, is because of their per annum trust fees again at 1.5 percent it's easily tripled that of east west and bdo so even though the strategy works and was working before they raised their trust fees now it's just coming out that you're not going to be able to make much if you keep your money with bpi i'm actually surprised with the results i thought that bpi would fare better Again, this is based on how it would have performed in the last 10 years. Of course, moving forward, things can change. The per annum trust fees and the minimum investments and as well as the performance of the actual fund, the S&P 500, can also vary greatly. I was thinking that the performance of BDO would be much worse because you aren't able to do it as regularly as you would with the other banks. What the data is showing is that if we are doing it monthly, every other month, or in BDO's case, even only a few times a year, as long as we are doing it consistently, then we're still able to get the gains of the market. What worked out for BDO would be again the low 0.5% per annum trust fees. As the data shows, these trust fees, as small as they seem, really, really matter. So, what do you guys think? I actually thought that I would be keeping a lot of my money in BPI's UITFs, but with this, uh, I think it's time to move. If you've liked this video, please don't forget to like, comment, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Thanks again for watching, guys, and happy investing!